Welcome back to our study of the book of Matthew. This uh, particular video and the next one will focus on chapters 8 through 10. And so you might be opening your Bibles to that particular chapter or those uh, chapters within the book of Matthew. Kind of moving into another section of the book, but nonetheless one that pertains to the whole of the purpose of the book of Matthew. Uh, this video also is going to bring back the option of uh, on the screen uh, slides. And so I was able to figure out that technology or find a way to, to use that technology again. So hopefully that helps you as it kind of outlines or takes us through our study and, and has the key point that we're making at the time on the screen. So we'll go ahead and bring that in. And we'll notice here that with Matthew chapter 8 through 10, we're actually going to be focused on the miracles of Jesus. And the question at the top of the screen simply says, what did he do? Now, remember the purpose of Matthew. The overall focus that Matthew has is to present Jesus as the king and his kingdom. And so there's going to be, as we've already looked at, the introductory matters that would present Jesus as the legal heir and the fulfillment of prophecy. Then in chapter 5 through uh, 7, we had focused on the things that he said because you're always concerned with what did he say. If he is going to be the legitimate king, the heir of David, the one who would sit upon the throne, then there's going to have to be a consideration of his speech or of the things that he says. Not from the standpoint of correct gr grammar and all of that stuff, but just from the way in which he talks. And of course, when you looked at what he had to say relative to the matter of his kingdom, the, the character of the, the citizen of the kingdom or the kingdom subject, the motive of the kingdom subject, the discernment of the kingdom subject, the uh, precepts for the kingdom subject, all of those things that he spoke of, one thing that we point out is the fact that he spoke with inherent authority, and the people recognized that. So those chapters dealt with Matthew's purpose as it presented what he said. But now in chapters 8 through 10, we're going to get into this next matter of what did he do? What was it within the actions of Jesus that would lend to the, the fact that he was the king or is the king, that he was the rightful heir to the throne, that he is the Messiah, the one that the, the Old Testament had prophesied would come? And so as Matthew is attempting to accomplish his purpose here, in what he has to write, he wants to focus on the miracles of Jesus. Now, I want you for a moment to consider Acts 2 and verse 22. We have some preliminary matters that we need to discuss relative to miracles and the miracles of Jesus. And I want you to think about, because Acts 2.22 kind of sums up what point Matthew is trying to make relative to him being a king. Matthew chapter 2, this is Peter beginning the sermon on the day of Pentecost, the initial or inaugural sermon of the kingdom in the day that it was actually brought into existence or established in this earth. So notice here he says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. So there was a demonstration of God's approval or God's selection of him. How was that done? Well, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So Peter references these miraculous works of Jesus as a demonstration of God's approval of, of Jesus as the Messiah. So let's consider those three words for just a moment, because in Acts or in uh, Matthew chapter eight through ten, you're actually going to see uh, ten miracles that that Jesus will perform. You're going to see Matthew's record of ten individual miracles that Jesus did, and then in chapter ten, you're also going to see the power that Jesus had to impart the ability to perform miracles as he gives the limited commission unto his apostles. And so Acts 2.22 speaks of the miracles, signs, and wonders, which were a key evidence of who Jesus was. 
What do these three words mean? Well, the word miracle simply appeals to power. It's a word that brings to our attention or to our mind God approved of him or demonstrated his approval of him or his selection of him, him being the Messiah, because of the power that was on display. When you think about miracles, we're obviously thinking about that which is above natural law or uh, even supernatural is what we're talking about. And it is an appeal to power, works of supernatural ability, such as could not be done by natural agents or natural means, things that could not be done without the divine power working through an individual. And of course, that was a recognized understanding in the miracles that Jesus did. You, you take Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 27 but the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? See, far beyond natural man. There is no natural man. There is no human being that is able to control the waves of the sea or the storms of this world. If there was, then we wouldn't be dealing with massive tornadoes massive hurricanes, and things like that devastating the land. Now, that's part of the natural world. That's part of the natural realm, the phenomena of nature that God has created and put in place. And sometimes it brings sad uh, circumstances to individuals who so suffer uh, from those things. But man has not been able to harness or cannot harness the the power to command the natural elements. And so man doesn't have the natural ability, or we might say the supernatural ability, to do the things that are done. But Jesus demonstrates that power. We think about the term signs, and here's an appeal to understanding, that this is focused on a miracle or this supernatural working of Jesus from the standpoint of what it signifies. These, these miraculous workings, what Jesus did in his miracles, actually was a sign or signified something to be understood by the mind. There's a meaning behind it. Now, of course, the word sign in the Bible carries other more generic meanings as well, but as it applies to the miracle, it is a specific application of how a miracle gives a certain understanding as you consider it. Uh, think about the Gospel of John in particular, because John sums up the miracles that he records of Jesus, which there are eight specific miracles in the, in the Gospel record of John, and he says, these are written that you might believe. Those signs, and, and John references that the miracles had a significance, like Jesus claimed he was the bread of life. Well, guess what? He produced physical bread and that signified or gave an understanding his ability to provide the spiritual nutrition that is needed for the soul. And, and there are other things within there that we could look at, but John says these were signs. These were significant, demonstrating Jesus to be the Son of God. And your mind can understand or comprehend those things. Well, here in our text, one of these miracles in particular that points out this this understanding is the one at, at the beginning of chapter 9 when he speaks to the man sick of palsy. And he simply says, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee, in verse number 2. And the fact that he healed the man that was sick of palsy signaled or gave a sign, a significance, that whoever could make this man walk was also one who could forgive sin. And so that miracle signals or gave forth the understanding, it appealed to the mind of man, to the understanding of man, that Jesus had the power to forgive sin. But then we take this word wonder, and again, an appeal to the mind uh, in, in the sense of the imagination. It's something uh, that causes the beholder to marvel uh, because it hadn't been seen like that or it hadn't been done like that. Or things like that were obviously in a supernatural way, 
as the text would determine here, they were able to create an awe within the mind of the individual as they looked on at Jesus who was able to do this great miracle. And of course, within this particular passage of, of Matthew 8, 9, and 10, that is going to be clear. So why, why does Matthew include this? Well, it's important to know what he did. And the very fact that he focuses on the miracles of Jesus in the things that Jesus did demonstrates the approval of God or demonstrates, signifies to us that this was, is the Messiah. And so John, uh, rather Matthew, records not only the things Jesus said, but also the things he did. And these are significant. In these chapters, there's going to be 10 miracles that is that are going to be uh, outlined, that are going to be given to us. And I think the number 10 also becomes significant. You see a pattern in Matthew. You could break down verse, uh, or rather chapter 5 through 7 into 10 parts. You, you understand there are 10 miracles that John, or rather that Matthew focuses on. And then there are going to be 10 reactions that will be discussed from chapter 11 to chapter 18. The term 10 being significant of completeness, um, a symbolic uh, number uh, on occasion. Uh, but whatever, whether that be Matthew's intent or not, the 10 that he selects are sufficient to the point. And, and so they present what Jesus did in a demonstration of who he was. Now, let's talk about these miracles for a moment. As we think about the miracles of Jesus being supreme evidence of his, his heirship to the throne and his rightful uh, positioning to take that throne. Think about these miracles. And of course, sometimes you have to look at them in, in light of, of what is done today in the contrast of what some people refer to as miracles today. What we're talking about are things that are beyond supernatural or beyond natural. They don't occur by natural means. Now, you know, today there are occasions when people use the term miracle in a, an accommodative way to speak of things that, that are amazing to our mind. Uh, some people even talk of things like childbirth as as a miracle. But childbirth is a natural phenomenon. God put that in motion as everything is to produce after its kind, and God implemented within the laws of nature the particular way in which that is to take place. And so childbirth is not miraculous. Now, in the sense that Jesus was born, it was, because we have a virgin conceiving of the Holy Spirit and bringing forth a son. With births like Isaac or John the Baptist, we have, we have uh, conceptions beyond the range of the natural time frame. Uh, those that were barren and those that were aged beyond the time period in which um, it could be accomplished. But childbirth is not a miraculous event, though it may be a, a, an amazing thing to, to those who have experienced it and to those who have been blessed by it. Uh, sometimes people talk about a miracle of surviving a car wreck. And, and in, my, in my family, I've had those that have had car wrecks. And you look at the car, you look at the whole situation after the wreck has occurred, and you say, well, it's a wonder that they didn't get hurt. And an occasion where where my brother-in-law was sitting at an intersection, there was a wreck in front of him and a boat flew off a trailer, wasn't down properly and went right uh, over the intersection, hit their van and the motor tore the van roof in half. And fortunately, he and his daughter uh, were unscathed as it went right between them, him in the driver's seat and her in the passenger seat. My wife has been in, in a severe uh, car accident where someone failed to to stop at an intersection. She was stopped at a red light. The collision was so violent that it pushed my wife's car with my daughter in it as well, right through a four lane intersection. The, the trunk of the car was right up to the back of the front seats. The, the seats themselves were, were collapsed and broken. And it was just amazing that they didn't get seriously injured, but it wasn't miraculous. 
it's within the realm of nature. Uh, there's beauties of, of nature sometimes that are referred to as miracles. Of course, the beginning point, God creating, that was miraculous, but the, the creation itself, now that it is intact and being preserved by God's providence, that's just the natural order of things that God put into motion. Uh, the dawning of a new day, uh, anything that causes wonder. Sometimes things that we don't understand are referred to as miracles, but they're really not. They're just amazing things that sometimes our mind doesn't know how to comprehend. And, and so understand that sometimes we'll use the term miracle in an accommodative way, but not in the scriptural or biblical sense of the miracles that Jesus used. Always be sure we're defining our terms properly and understanding what we're talking about. Let's talk about these miracles of Jesus, though. Number one, clearly they were. And what we mean by that, that may have, when you first saw that on the screen, clearly they were, you, you may have, what's he mean? Well, clearly they were miracles. Without question, miracles had occurred. Something that was supernatural, something that was beyond the limits of nature. Even the enemies couldn't deny it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 16, it, there was a miracle that was performed that could not be denied, even by the enemies. James and John, or uh, Peter and John rather, had healed a lame man at the gate that was called Beautiful of the Temple. And there was no denying that a miracle had been done. He was walking around. He, he was living evidence that, that a miracle had occurred. This man had been lame from birth. I believe he was some 40 years old, and, and now he's walking around instantly healed. And so that couldn't be denied. And there's also the vision to see imposters. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is you take a man like Simon the sorcerer who bewitched the people in Acts chapter 8, um, Simon understood the distinction between the miracles that Peter and John did and those that Philip did with what he was claiming to do. And so it was very clear to Simon the distinction between miracles and not miracles. And so clearly they were miracles without question, the things that Jesus did. And you'll notice throughout the gospel records, they were never denied. Even the adversaries, the Pharisees, uh, who, who constantly challenged Jesus, never challenged whether a miracle was actually done. And we'll make another point about that as we go through the chapters uh, because of their response to the last things, or well, a couple actually, of the miracles that Jesus does here. Number two, we would point out that they had purpose. All of the miracles of Jesus had significance. And again, we talk about this with, with uh, the book of John and the, the term sign, but here, Jesus, in, in chapter 9 of Matthew, verse number 1 uh, through verse number 7, had a purpose in healing this man. And, and apparently the the problem that this man had with palsy or with paralysis was connected to some kind of sin that he had committed. And so in Jesus forgiving his sin, Jesus signifies by that miracle the power that he had to forgive sin. And, and so all of these miracles had significance. There was always a purpose. There was rhyme and reason to why they were done. They also weren't mysterious. Uh, if you know, you know, sometimes today, there are those who claim miraculous ability, modern day miracles, but some of the things that they claim cannot actually be observed. They're not observable things. But, but you take what Jesus does, the very first miracle that Matthew records, not the first miracle that Jesus performed, but the first one that Matthew addresses is healing a man of leprosy. Leprosy was an observable disease, especially in its late advanced stages. You, you take this disease that is very seen, it, it's evident, it's apparent, it can be observed, and Jesus heals him, and immediately he is cleansed of his leprosy. That, that's not a mysterious miracle. That is something that is observable. The, the people could actually see it happen. 
You take something like paralysis, where, where one is drawn up, the man that was at the gate that Peter and John healed, it was observable. Everybody knew that that man's legs didn't work. In, in our case here, um, of, of Matthew chapter 8 through 10, you have two occasions where palsy was healed. Here in verse number 6, the uh, centurion had a servant sick of palsy and was grievously tormented. And then in verse number 2 of chapter 9, a man sick of palsy lying on a bed. Again, paralysis, as it is spoken of here, is not a mysterious disease that cannot be observed. It was something that was observable. And so the, the miracles of Jesus were not mysterious. Number four, they, there was no need for time when Jesus performed a miracle. And what we mean by that is they were immediate in their, their result. So if Jesus healed a man of paralysis, then immediately that person was able to use whatever portion of the body had been paralyzed. Now, that's not, that's not natural. Anyone who has, who has suffered some kind of, of uh, injury that has not permitted a limb to work properly. Maybe your arm was in a cast, your leg was in a cast, maybe severe injury to where you weren't able to move about. You understand how the muscle over time can deteriorate or can become weakened if it's not in use. And so as you think about these individuals who had paralysis, immediately they're able to go about life as though they had not been paralyzed. The other thing about immediacy here that you could think about in no time um, needed for healing is Peter's mother-in-law. She laid sick of fever in, in chapter 8 and verse number 14. Now, Luke, who was a physician, referred to it as a great fever. In that first century, fevers were divided into two categories, the small and the great, or the lesser and the greater. She had a great fever, so it was a serious condition. And of course, if there's none of us who have gone through life without at some point in time having a fever. Our body's natural response to something that is foreign within the body and our immune system attacking it. So you understand what it is to have fever, and perhaps you've even had a severe fever and, and how debilitating that can be when it is upon the body. And even afterwards, once it subsides, once healing is affected and, and your body naturally begins to, to recover, you understand that strength is not immediately renewed. But notice with Peter's mother-in-law, as soon as Jesus heals her, the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. Immediately, she's made whole. Immediately, she is as though she never had fever. The sea is calmed in, in verse 23 through 27. Immediately, uh, the winds and the seas uh, were calmed. That's not natural. Anytime there is a storm upon the Gulf of Mexico that is just to my south, there is going to be waves that, that persist for days after a, a tropical storm or a hurricane. But for Jesus to rebuke the winds and the sea and immediately there would be no more waves, there would be no more storm, the wind would cease, the, the waves would calm, that is miraculous. And it happened instantaneously. It didn't happen over time. We might also note that there was always witnesses to these things. Even with the daughter of the ruler, uh, Jairus, when Jesus goes into the room where she, the, the dead girl, lay, at 12 years old, she had died. She was a corpse. And Jesus walks into her room. He takes three people, Peter, James, and John. There were always witnesses to what transpired. And so they weren't done in a corner. They weren't done secretly. They weren't done under the cloak of, of being hidden. They were open for anybody to evaluate, for anybody to consider, and even for someone to counter and, and try to explain that it wasn't actually a miracle, but it never happened. Always they had witnesses. Number six, they were always, or they were unrestricted, we might say. 
That is, there's a variety that is accomplished, even within these 10 that Matthew records. And there were so many miracles that Jesus did. John in John chapter 21, in verse 24 and 25, would tell us that the number of, of signs, the number of miracles, the things that Jesus actually did, if the books were to be recorded or if they were to be recorded in books, he says perhaps the world wouldn't be able to contain them. And so what we're, we're identifying there is that there was many, many, many miracles that Jesus performed. Matthew records 10 of them that transpired in the area or in the province, provincial area of Galilee. And they were unrestricted, a variety that were accomplished. Uh, some of them were dealing with disease. Some of them were dealing with the natural. Some of them dealt with the spiritual. Some of them dealt with even the moral realm. And so as we, we think about these uh, miracles, even within these 10, there is a great variety from any aspect that you could focus on, even to the point of raising the dead. And typically speaking, those who claim to work miracles today, those who claim a modern power to, to perform miracles, they don't have the variety that Jesus had. And one thing that they never do is show up at the local cemetery and start raising the dead. But Jesus did. Jesus raises the daughter of Jairus here. In John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus who had been dead. Uh, he, he raised others from the dead, like the widow's son. But his, his miracles were unrestricted. And then finally, a seventh thing about it, they were complete. Um, in, in, in the passage that we're looking at, chapter 8 through 10, there is a miracle where he heals blind men, men who had no sight. Now, that's still one of those things that man is not able to fix readily especially if if the optic nerve is is severed or something happens with the optic nerve that's not something man can recreate and and bring sight back to there are things that can be done to to enhance the sight like i currently have contact lenses in uh, that is within the, the natural realm what man can do however should my optic nerves be severed there is nothing man could do to restore my sight. Jesus takes these blind men and he heals them. But when he heals them, they didn't need glasses. I've noticed on occasion where individuals have claimed that they had been healed. They'd been given their sight only to wear glasses or, or to, to later on need glasses. It wasn't so with Jesus. Sight was given completely or perfectly when Jesus healed the deaf. They could hear, not with the aid of a hearing device, but perfectly able to hear. The miracles of Jesus were complete, even within the, the calming of the sea, and, and not here in Matthew chapter 9, or rather Matthew chapter 8, but in other occasions of calming the sea, it mentions that immediately they were upon the dry land. And so there is a completeness to the miracles that Jesus performed, and these are all evidences that Jesus was who he said he was. He is the Messiah. He did have the right to the throne, and sitting upon the throne, he has the right to, co to command or to lead his kingdom. Now, let's also mention this right here relative to miracles in dealing with the, the categories of the purpose of miracles. Anytime we talk about the miraculous, we, we need to introduce the, the subject matter here as to what these miracles were about. What were they for? Obviously, here we're, we're talking about uh, God approving of Jesus through these things or demonstrating that Jesus was his beloved son and the, the Christ. As Peter would say, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. And these things prove that. But regarding miracles, when we talk about categories or purpose, there was the matter of inspiration, <clears throat> God's power, God's word. And so the, the word of God being given to man, the inspiration of God's word is miraculous. We also understand that the confirmation of God's word is a dedicated purpose of the miraculous. 
Hebrews chapter 2 in verse number 4 speaks of God bearing witness. Now he's talking about the great salvation that some in, in the Hebrew audience were on the verge of neglecting. They were allowing it to slip away. They were regressing and actually going backwards. And so he is encouraging them within that book to retain their faith, strengthen their faith, and remain with Jesus. Don't go back to the old law. Stick with the law of Christ and the kingdom of Christ. And, and he says there that this great salvation that they were beginning to allow to drip away or to slip away first began to be preached by Jesus and then by those that heard him, speaking of his apostles, God also bearing them witness through signs and wonders and divers miracles, which he did through them. And so these miracles had a confirming uh, purpose, uh, the inspiration of God's word. It was a way of, of providing God's word to be sure that it was God's word. It was the confirmation of God's word with the miracle conducting uh, conducted along with it. It was a demonstration or a sign that the speaker was actually presenting the word of God or that what, what was given in the message was actually God's word. And then, of course, there is the matter of perfection. And, and here the miracles or, or the, the things pertaining to the miraculous are like scaffolding. There, there is a building up of the perfect structure uh, dealing with the kingdom. And the miracles were like the scaffolding that is erected as a building is, is being built. But of course, once the building is, is done, that scaffolding is taken away. It doesn't remain there perfect. Uh, you know, and once the building is complete, it doesn't remain forever. And so when you study God's word relative to the miracles, the purpose, the categories of the miracles, there are miracles that pertain to inspiration. There are miracles that were about confirmation of the message, and all of those miracles were about the perfection of God's word in God's kingdom. Whether you're looking in 1 Corinthians 13, Ephesians chapter 4, or other passages dealing with the miraculous, this demonstrates their, their purpose and their, their categories. Now, having said that, we need to understand this about miracles. All three of those things point to the duration of the miraculous. They point to the end of the miraculous power being utilized. If it was about the inspiration of God's word, and God's word has been inspired, it is complete, then no longer would miracles be inspiring men to present God's word. We have God's word. If it was about the confirmation of the message to confirm that these words were from God, then those miracles would have ended once the complete message of God had been given. And if it was about perfection until we all come to the unity of the faith, until we all come to the measure of the perfect man in Christ Jesus, speaking of, of the church in its perfection or the kingdom in its perfection, once that perfection comes, then you take the scaffolding down. So all three of those points regarding the, the, the category or the purpose of miracles, they all point to, to a time period in which the miraculous power would, would cease. There would be a cessation of that power. So think about it. Ha, has it ended? Well, what about experience? Do we see miracles today? Now, I know people claim they do, but in comparison to what Jesus did, and remember, Jesus empowered his, his apostles to do miracles as he did them. Peter healed a lame man, a man who could not walk. He healed him. Jesus healed palsied men. Uh, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Jesus raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead here in, in Matthew chapter 9. So those works that he did, that, that Jesus did, were also seen done by his apostles. So why don't you see those things today? Show me where one has been raised from the dead. Show me 
where one that was paralyzed has been healed to the point of immediately using those limbs as though they had never been paralyzed. Certain things that we can see. Show me the man who calms the sea. Show me that individual. We're, we're fast approaching the, uh, of course, right now we're in the getting into this toward the spring of the year when, when your thunderstorms are popping up all over and, and uh, tornadic activity is, is more uh, probable in, in this part of the year, March and April. Show me the person who can stop a tornado or can repair the destruction immediately. Show me the person as we get toward June, July, August, and then into September and October who can come down to the Gulf Coast and command the calming of a hurricane before it makes landfall. It just doesn't happen. So our experience, just observing life today, would tell us that those miracles have ended. We could also point out that their purpose was fulfilled. If they were to inspire God's word, inspire men to present God's word, and now we have God's word in its completion, if they were to confirm the word of God, and now that word has been confirmed, then the purpose for which those things were given is no longer needed because it was complete. Just like with the law of Moses, when we talked about it in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus explaining his relationship to the law. Once it was fulfilled, once the purpose of the law was fulfilled through Jesus, then there was no more need for that law. It was taken out of the way. It was nailed to the cross. With the miraculous, once the purpose was complete, once it was fulfilled, there was no more need, so it was taken out of the way. And we could even say the scripture confirms that. In 1 Corinthians 13, 10, when he's talking about miraculous things, talking about miraculous prophecy, talking about miraculous knowledge and other matters, as, as 1 Corinthians chapter 12 outlined nine spiritual gifts, he said that which is in part, that revelation piece by piece, uh, was, was going to continue until that which is perfect is come. And just a, a quick note, that word perfect is not a reference to Jesus there. It's not in the masculine gender. And, and any time the scripture references Jesus, it always uses the masculine gender. That which is perfect in the neuter gender is a reference to that, that uh, word of God that was being given piece by piece. And, and Paul explains how those miraculous powers were going to cease. It was temporary and it was taken out of the way when that which is perfect was come, because it was no longer needed. And so as to the duration of these miracles, they, they were utilized by God relative to Jesus to show that he was the Messiah, to generate within the minds of people through the evidence presented that undoubtedly he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so the miracles of Jesus as we look at them, we need to, to underscore that point. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, let's think about the chapters for a moment and what we actually have within them. We've given some consideration to the place of miracles, why Matthew would, would present um, this section within his purpose and carrying out his plan to show Jesus to be the, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and so now we know how those miracles do that, why those miracles do that. But now let's look at, at the content itself. And this is kind of an overview of chapters 8 through 10. I want you to notice, first of all, the content uh, pertaining to the miracles. In chapter 8 and verse 1, chapter 8 and verse 5, chapter 8 and verse 14, 8, 23, 8, 28, you have five miracles recorded in that chapter. In chapter 9, verse 1, 18, 20, 27, and 32, you have five additional miracles that are recorded. Now remember, these chapters are, are and verses are actually implemented by man. When Matthew wrote the book of Matthew, 
the, the treatise of Matthew. He did not divide it into chapters and verses. It was more of what you would see in a essay format, uh, a, a block style or paragraph style um, writing, like we would write a letter. And so as, as he writes this manuscript, um, later on, man, for the ease of convenience of going through it and identifying in a quick way a, a particular thing said within the book, we have chapters and verses. So it, it's subdivided five and five as you look at it, five in chapter eight, five in chapter nine. It might just make a quick note regarding chapter 10. Chapter 10 is more about Jesus giving that power to the disciples to work those miracles. And so Jesus worked the miracles himself, but also inherent within him was the ability to give that ability or to relay that ability to others. Now, notice the breaks within the chapter. In chapter 8 and verse 18, you'll notice that he sees the multitude and he gave commandment to depart to the other side. A scribe comes to him and Jesus addresses. So he, he turns the multitude, he addresses the multitude there. We have a break uh, in the miraculous. You have three miracles, uh, 8, 1, 8, 5, and 8, 14. Three distinct miracles. And then there's a point at which Jesus addresses the multitude. Then there are three more miracles, 8, 23, 8, 28, and then 9 in verse 1. And then you have another break at verse number 10, where Jesus in, in Matthew 9, verse 10, addresses the Pharisees or answers the Pharisees relative to their, their uh, questioning of, of what he's doing and uh, calling Matthew to follow him, who was a public and a tax collector. And he, he convenes at his house to eat. And, and they're bothered by that. So Jesus addresses them. And, and so there is a natural break while chapters 8 and 9 each have five miracles within them. When you take that content and you notice those breaks, there's actually a subdivision of the miracles where you have a set of three, then an address by Jesus, three more, and then an address by Jesus, and then four final ones. And, and in those breaks, as you see them, there is a notable uh, purpose that, that Matthew has in recording it the way he does. With those first three miracles, you, you might want to pay attention to the things that Jesus says and does that are, are outstanding or that are notable. In the next three, chapter 8, 23, 28, and then 9, 1, in those three miracles, you might want to take a note at what is said about Jesus, the remarkable things that are said about Jesus and the miracles that he performed. And then as you come to those final four, there's, there's a distinctive nature to them as opposed to the first six where they are cumulative or they, they bring about a climax in a certain way. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So we basically have two sets of three and then a set of four relative to the miracles as we break down the chapter. Now, as we look to that, think about the first section. The first three miracles actually address matters that pertain to the whole body. They were problems that affected the whole of the body of the individual. Leprosy, paralysis, and fever. Uh, we have the man that was a leper. In verse number three, uh, his leprosy was cleansed immediately. We have the centurion's servant in verse six that's home sick of the palsy. And we have Peter's mother-in-law who had a great fever. All three of those problems affected the entirety of the body, and Jesus was able to immediately heal them so that the entirety of the body was, was restored wholly and able to be used fully. Then we have with the second section, we have broader spheres. We have three distinct miracles, one in which involves nature. Jesus demonstrated power over nature. He demonstrated power over the spiritual realm uh, regarding um, the, the uh, casting out of unclean spirits. And then he 
also demonstrated power in the moral realm because he forgave a man of his sins. And by healing him of his palsy, it demonstrated that he had the power within the, the framework or the, the area of morality to forgive sin. And so those miracles present a, a picture of Jesus not only having ability over the human body to cure the entirety of the human body, but here in the, in the realm of nature, the realm of the spiritual, and the realm of the moral, Jesus has extensive power. He has complete power. There's none like him in all the earth. And then, of course, the, the fourth or the third group that contains four, they are local organic ailments of the body, whether we're dealing with the hemorrhage of blood, whether we're dealing with being dead, whether we're dealing with blindness, or, or even the matter of um, uh, casting out, uh, well, the, the ability of the dumb to speak, uh, casting out the devil at the end with 9, 27 to 31. Now think about those three things in their climactic form. Uh, Jesus healed all manner of disease, but we have a climax here in the healing of Jairus's daughter because he raised her from the dead. That is a climactic uh, event. Above all disease, not only was he able to heal diseases that were within the living, once they brought about death, he had power over life. Jesus is also represented in a climactic way with the woman of, of the hemorrhaging of blood because as, he, as she touches the hem of her garment, it signifies that Jesus was the source himself of this and, and that virtue issued from him and, and she was healed and made whole in the same instant. And, and with the making the blind to see, there is a, a completeness there as well. Uh, in, in a climax, as he focuses on their faith, they had faith and, and he, he brings that out and then the Pharisee belief, a climax with, with the Pharisees uh, being opposed to him. And so that's what we're looking at within these chapters in the miracles of Jesus. There's a reason why Matthew presents them. And, and we need to understand that purpose and what they collectively say about Jesus. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and infallibly so. These are infallible proofs, as we talked about his miracles, the, the very nature of his miracles. There is no doubt, if, if we are going to honestly assess the content, that there is no way that we can come away without knowing Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He's a man approved of God. And that should bring about a direct response from us to heed the king and his commandment. Next video, we'll look more specifically within the content as we go through the miracles and think about specific things within the text itself. God bless you as you continue to study the book of